Good morning, Gateway Bible Church. Please turn in your scriptures to Luke chapter 13. We are starting in verse 10 this morning. As we conclude our sermon series, Destiny Revealed. Today is the last day of that sermon series. Uh, the title for this morning's sermon is Made Straight in the Kingdom of God. Made Straight in the Kingdom of God. Now, I would just ask that you join with me in bowing your hearts and your minds one more time this morning as we prepare ourselves for what the Lord has for us. Would you just, would you do that with me now? Father, Lord, we give thanks and praise and glory to you for what is already occurred here in this sanctuary this morning and now we do it again for what is about to occur we just love to come before you and hear your voice through your word your message your will for our lives lord we know that it is important we know that there is nothing more important and we declare to you that we are willing and ready lord your holy spirit needs to guide us and direct us and teach us and apply your word to our life this morning. Please do that in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Uh, permit me, if you will, to provide us a recap of what has been going on over the last several weeks in the Gospel of Luke. If you didn't, uh, here are the last couple of sermons. If you weren't here in the sanctuary, if you weren't watching online, this is a perfect opportunity just to kind of catch up. And remember that Jesus issues this great lengthy sermon beginning back in chapter 12, at the beginning of chapter 12. It's a lengthy discourse. It's a lengthy teaching. It's a, it's a lengthy message. Call it whatever you what you want to, but it begins in chapter 12, and it continued all the way through chapter 13, verse 9 of last week. Now, what was Jesus teaching? Well, he was teaching us about what it meant to be one of his followers. He taught us things like we must stop fearing man and fear God alone. Remember what he said? Don't be afraid of those that can kill the body, but be afraid of God alone who has the power after the body has been destroyed to cast you into hell. He said we must turn from false religion. He said beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He says we must confess, we must confess Jesus as Lord and we must give ourselves up to a life in the Holy Spirit. He says, stop being materialistic. Don't be bigger barn builders. He says, we must stop pursuing the world and pursue his kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus said. And then he added, of course, you must do all of this now. Because you never know when I am coming back. He says, I'm coming back like a thief in the night. And at the beginning of chapter 13 last week, what did he say? He says, you never know when a tower is going to fall on you. You never know when your life will be required of you. You and I are not the master over life nor are we the master over death. Amen? Amen? Now, this morning, our Lord begins to pivot his, his uh, teaching away from the crowd and onto the kingdom of God. He begins to answer the who and the what and the why and the how and the where questions about the kingdom. This morning, we are going to see four precepts, four precepts that will prepare us for his teaching 
That happens next week when uh, we start our new sermon series in verse 22. Now, for now, let's begin our study in verse 10 of chapter 13, where it simply says, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. So the scene shifts now uh, to one of the synagogues in the Galilee region, where again... Jesus is teaching in a synagogue, but he's not only teaching in a synagogue, he's teaching in a synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now, I want to take this opportunity just to remind us what a synagogue was in the time of Christ. Comes from the Greek word. Our, it's actually our English word synagogue is actually from a Greek word synagogues. And it simply means gathering place. It simply means meeting place. It can also mean house of instruction. That's what a synagogue is. Historians tell us that about uh, there were about 250 synagogues, at least 250 synagogues in the Galilee region at the time of Christ here on earth. Let, re let me remind you that synagogues came into existence after the Babylonian exile. After uh, they were taken, the Jews were all taken into captivity into Babylon. When they were taken into captivity, they had become separated from their place of worship, which was the temple. Before that, there was no such thing as a synagogue. The synagogue was not the temple. The temple is where you went for ceremonies. The temple is where you went for uh, rituals. That's where you went to offer sacrifices. Synagogues had no sacrifices. They didn't celebrate, uh, celebrate the Passover or any of the feasts in a synagogue. It was simply a place to gather. There was no priest. There was, on most of these synagogues, simply a board of elders, a, a group of men who were called elders. And out of that group, one of those men would have been called the ruler. And the ruler of the synagogue was in charge of of administering the business and overseeing the synagogue. It was a local gathering place, sound familiar? For worship and teaching the word of God. And to Jesus, this was the perfect place to go and teach. Throughout the book of Luke. We see that whenever Jesus entered into a particular geographic region, what did he do? He searched out the synagogue there. He would always find a synagogue on the Sabbath because that's where he could find the Jews gathered around the word of God. Interestingly enough, this is the last time that Jesus enters a synagogue, especially in the Gospel of Luke. So... Now you know a little bit about the synagogue. Let's pick up this narrative in verse 11, where Jesus finds there a woman who has been troubled for many years. It says in verse 11, And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and he said to her, Woman, you, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. In this synagogue, Jesus finds someone who desperately needs Jesus. Who desperately needs him. Look what it says in verse 12. It says, when Jesus saw her, he called her up to him. He calls this woman front and center in the synagogue. Luke describes this woman as a, one who has been crippled for 18 years. This 
uh, crippling came from a spirit. She is being possessed for 18 years and this spirit is not allowing her to stand straight. So here's a woman for 18 years who's not only bent over double, but she is looked upon with scorn. Here's a woman that's not only in a terrible position physically, but she's in a terrible, more importantly, she's in a terrible position uh, socially. Why? Well, remember this. This is the common theology, the common philosophy, the common uh, teaching that Jesus had to refute and encounter so much of the time as he's progressed throughout the Gospel of Luke. What's that theology? We saw Jesus teach about this last week about the when he's talking about the Tower of Siloam incident. The, it, it, it went something like this. The basic view was that if you are suffering, you must have done something wrong and therefore God is punishing you. We saw that. After all, remember uh, Job. Uh, Job, uh, uh, all, all his friends came to Job and said, hey, Job, you must have done something wrong. There, there's, there's obviously some sin in your life. That's why you're suffering. Remember the blind man in John chapter 9. They came to Jesus and they asked him, who sinned, this blind man or his parents? So that, that theology was pervasive. And besides all of that, she's a woman. A woman in the synagogue. Remember that women belonged where? In the back and out of sight. And now, all of a sudden, Jesus calls her up front and makes her the focal point. What's he doing? Well, he's, he's honoring this poor outcast woman. Jesus has no interest in bizarre power trips. He has no interest in people's self-righteousness. He has no interest in those who are seeking to elevate themselves above others. You will always see Jesus' authority is supreme. That's how he leads as he enters into the synagogue. And what does he do? He elevates this one individual that they would seek to tuck away and to keep secret. Now, without denying the historical accuracy of this event, of this miracle, uh, I need to point out some obvious symbolic value here that Luke gives us by putting this miracle exactly in this place in his gospel. Here's the first kingdom precept that we see in these verses. And that is, in God's kingdom, the king lifts us to a position of uprightness. In God's kingdom, the king lifts us to a position of uprightness. In other words, Jesus is the great chiropractor. Amen? It reminds me of the famous chiropractor joke. Do you know how it is that Quasimodo found the chiropractor? He had a hunch. Now, I tell you that joke so that you can, uh, yes, laugh, but more importantly, that you can uh, remember that Jesus is the great chiropractor. And I tell you that, not that you can walk around saying, hey, everybody, Jesus is the great chiropractor, but more importantly, that you can remember this free first precept. Jesus uh, is the king who lifts us up to a position of uprightness. Amen? Jesus came to deliver us from these crippling influences. And all of us at some point in our life were just like this crippled woman. We all had various ailments, didn't we? 
We were all suffering from some kind of crippling influence. Some of us were suffering from uh, physical pain. Some of us were suffering from emotional pain. Some of us were suffering from addiction. Some of us were suffering from pride. Some of us were suffering from impenetrable hearts. But until we meet the King, the risen Christ, we were all crippled with spiritual blindness. Amen? And here is this graphic example of the king's touch bringing this woman into this position of uprightness. Now, notice what happens. Immediately, the, the scripture says, immediately she, she stands up straight and begins praising God. And by the way, immediately is the word that you will see there every time that Jesus heals someone. There's no delay. There's no pondering if this is legitimate or not. It was apparent. And that's the proper response to the work of the king. It shows that she at least understands the kingdom of God had visited her and, and that she was showed mercy by the great and sovereign king. But I got to tell you that not everyone is as jubilant as this woman is. Look what happens in verse 14. Luke says in verse 14, but the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. You would have thought what? You would have thought that this ruler of the synagogue, after witnessing this miracle, starts glorifying and rejoicing in God and leading others to the same place. But that's not what happens. No. The official castigates the Lord for healing on the Sabbath. Six days. You've got six days. Don't come in here and heal on the seventh. No. Look at this irony. Notice that the ruler is not castigating Jesus Christ for healing this woman. The miracle is performed. The miracle is recognized. In other words, Jesus is not thrown out of the synagogue as a fake or a charlatan, is he? Rather, the problem is that Christ heals on the Sabbath. Now, Jewish law allowed for, or not Jewish law, let's be more specific here. Jewish tradition allowed for uh, non-threatening, life-threatening emergencies to be dealt with on the Sabbath. But Jesus is healing people whom those leaders didn't consider emergencies. So the, 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 the synagogue ruler is in effect saying what? Come back during business hours. <laughs> Not on the Sabbath day. The synagogue ruler is indignant because Jesus is not following the law as he interprets it. Yes, the law said don't work on the Sabbath. Don't work your animals on the Sabbath. Rest. Let me tell you explicitly what it says in the law. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. God says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. What a wonderful expression of God's love, isn't it? God did not want to turn the Sabbath into the uh, worst day of the week. He wanted it to be the best day of the week. 
But it was their traditions that turned the Sabbath into the most brutal of all days. Why? Well, because self-righteous people need to make themselves righteous and holy. And they do that by constructing all of these rules that are designed to prove to themselves and to God that they are righteous and holy. Look what I've done, God. Look what I'm doing. I, 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 I'm following these really, really stringent rules of the Sabbath. Therefore, we must be good, right? Despite what's going on in my foul heart. Of course, there's nothing in the Word of God that says you cannot help someone on the Sabbath. You won't find it. Now, I find this interesting in, as well. Notice in verse 14 that the synagogue ruler didn't even have the courage to go and to speak to Jesus himself. What does he do? He speaks to the crowd. He doesn't protest to Jesus. He protests to the crowd. It's very passive-aggressive, isn't it? He does not want to confront the Lord directly. So what does he do? He goes and confronts the Lord through the crowd, whom, by the way, I bet you anything that he fears a lot less than Jesus Christ himself. He accuses them of coming. He accuses them of coming for a healing on the Sabbath. But that's not what happened, is it? Jesus is the one who takes the initiative. Jesus is the one that goes and seeks out this woman for a healing. A simple question. Do you suppose this synagogue ruler is indignant because Jesus is dishonoring the Sabbath somehow? Or is he indignant because this miracle that is performed sheds all of this glory onto Christ? He's got a woman in his congregation who needs mercy and compassion and tenderness and kindness. But he's the synagogue official. He's, he's the religious establishment guy, isn't he? He's a legalist and he's going to exercise his power and he's going to make things as difficult as possible because that's what legalists do. It's exactly what they do. Legalistic religion, it is harsh, it's brutal, it's merciless, and it's loveless. And by the way, just in case you think miracles are capable of producing faith, they are not. Here's the second precept that we need to know from these verses. And that is, in God's kingdom, faith is only produced in unrepentant hearts. Jesus says it all the time. Un unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Faith is only produced in repentant hearts. Did I say unrepentant? Scratch that, Marcus. That's going out on, you know, there it is. There it is. Repentant hearts. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's just the way it is. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Miracles can strengthen our faith. That is true. But it is only God's Holy Spirit that can produce faith in us. And I need to tell you that he's only going to do it, just as we learned last week, for those who possess a willing and repentant heart. It's repentance that changes the heart. It's belief in the gospel. Here is a man who witnessed a miracle firsthand. And guess what? It doesn't matter to him at all. Why? Because his heart is bad. Now, Jesus finds it necessary to address this individual directly. And that happens in verse 15. It says in verse 15, the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, 
be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. So let's get the big picture here. Jesus walks into a synagogue. He confronts a demon by healing this woman who's possessed by that demon. And I find it tremendously interesting that that confrontation with the demon was not nearly as large and grand as dramatic as the confrontation that he has with this synagogue ruler. This hypocritical synagogue ruler. He calls him a hypocrite because he had a hypocritical disregard for the law. He objects to the healing, even though this healing reveals the ultimate purpose for the law. Jesus' healing reveals the ultimate purpose for the law in the first place. What is it? It's to bring glory to God. And so he points out two massive problems with the religious establishment here. Number one, they interpret the law more flexibly for animals than they do for humans. Ouch. They saw nothing wrong with helping their animals out on the Sabbath day. And Jesus says, and you got to hear this now, especially in this modern world we live in, humans are much, much, much more important than animals. Hmm. And number two, Jesus says they couldn't recognize, they couldn't realize that we honor God on his day by resting from work, but we also honor God by doing his work. So look what it says in verse 17. All his adversaries were put to shame. The hypocrisy of Jesus' adversaries is obvious. And, and, and what happens? As, as a result, the, uh, the crowd is delighted, but these religious establishment guys, they are humiliated. And this brings us to the third precept found here about the kingdom. The third kingdom precept. And that is inside or outside God's kingdom, the truth of the king cannot be suppressed by any force. Amen? It just can't. I'm going to repeat it. Inside or outside the kingdom, the truth of the king cannot be suppressed by any force. They couldn't defeat the truth of Christ, and therefore they're being pictured as, as losers in the eyes of the people. And of course, this is the very thing that is getting deep, uh, Jesus into deeper and deeper and hotter water. Now, naturally, such a brazen uh, display of kingdom power is going to uh, start stirring in the minds of those who are listening to him. What, what is this kingdom going to be like, Lord? And so in verse 18, Jesus now instructs them and answers that question. Look what it says in verse 18. Jesus says, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and put in his garden, and it grew and became a large tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Short, two short parables Jesus gives us about the nature of the kingdom of God. It is like a mustard seed. Uh, the mustard seed was used in Jesus' day symbolically for something that was exceedingly small. He uses it in his teaching more than once. He uses it on different occasions. He uses it to talk about faith and how faith could blossom out of something that was just very tiny. And now he's using it again for something that is tiny and easily overlooked. This time he's talking about the kingdom. And so everyone listening at that moment would have understood what Jesus is saying. He's shocking, but he's perfectly clear. The, the kingdom of heaven is like the tiniest of all seeds. No, Jesus, stop right there. That can't be true. You've got this all wrong. 
We are expecting the kingdom of heaven to break when the Messiah comes with all of these exciting pyrotechnics. He's going to level our enemies and he's going to sweep us into this era of unprecedented peace. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And this principle is crucial in shaping the truth in our minds about the nature of the kingdom. Jesus says the kingdom will reach the ends of the earth. It will triumph over opposition. But not yet. And not now. And not instantly. No. Like a mustard seed uh, planted in the field, the kingdom of heaven is going to undergo slow and steady progress. Like a mustard seed that grows to what? A, 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 about, about 10 feet around the Lake of Galilee. It's all coming from this little tiny seed that barely you could see in the speck of your hand. And so Jesus says the kingdom of God will arise from some very improbable beginnings. Jesus says it might not look like much right now. He's talking to the crowd. It might not look uh, like much right now, but it's going to grow until uh, the, it gets large enough for all the birds of the air to come and nest in those branches. Look what Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 17, 23. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it. And it will bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. Under it, it will, will dwell birds of every sort. In the shadow of its branches, they, were dwell, they will dwell. What are those birds that Jesus is, is talking about? Those birds are you and those birds are me. Amen? Like we read from the book of Revelation this morning, God gives us here our fourth kingdom precept, and that is God's kingdom will grow to include people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now, in verse 20, Jesus adds one more parable to give us some more detail about this prophecy. Look what it says in verse 20. And again he said, To what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven with which a woman took and hid in three measures of mill till it was all leaven. So here Jesus pictures the kingdom of God as yeast, quietly permeating all that it contacts. And the lesson here is exactly the same as the parable of the mustard seed. He's describing the, the kingdom's uh, spreading and, and, and powerful influence. Now, I recognize this. I recognize that there are many good and qualified teachers that will say that the leaven must be speaking of some evil influence here, right? Because most of the time in Scripture, when leaven is discussed, it's, respeak, it's speaking about evil. They would, uh, they'd say that leaven is an evil influence inside the kingdom. But Jesus is not talking about here. That is not the context. If we have to go there, we've got to twist Jesus' words here. So the question becomes, is the kingdom of God a future reality that we should all be hoping for? Or is the kingdom of God a here and now reality that we should all be experiencing. Let me ask you that one more time. Is the kingdom of God a future reality that we should all be hoping for? Or is the kingdom of God a here and now reality that we should all be experiencing? The answer is yes. Yes, it is partly present and partly future. And you're talking to a futurist. You're talking to uh, someone who has studied, who has studied about the future blessings of that kingdom. But it is partly present and partly future. Many kingdom blessings are to be enjoyed now. 
just as the woman who was bent over double for 18 years. Amen. But many kingdom blessings are not here until Jesus Christ returns to establish his millennial reign here on earth. Some kingdom power is available to us now, but not all of it. Some of the curse, some of the misery of this age is to be overcome by the present reality of the kingdom. But all of it cannot be, my friends. The decisive battle against sin and Satan has been fought and won at the cross where our king sacrificed himself on our behalf. Isn't that glorious? But sin must still be fought. Satan must still be resisted. Sickness must still be prayed over. Death must still be endured until the second coming of the king and the consummation of the kingdom that he brings in. Now, I want to end with this. I want to end with this tremendous encouragement that is found with these truths here. The kingdom really has arrived. We can experience unprecedented benefits of that here and now and present kingdom. The sovereign king has come. The sovereign king has dealt with sin once and for all as he sacrificed himself on the cross. The sovereign king's righteousness is now ours by faith. The sovereign king's spirit is now dwelling within each one of us. The sovereign king's holiness is now working in us. The sovereign king's joy and peace has already been given to us. The sovereign king's power over Satan has already been given to us. He's given us the sword of his spirit. What's that? The word of God. The sovereign king gives us power to witness. And the sovereign king gives us gifts of the spirit, which we can now use to minister and do wonderful things in his now and present kingdom. Amen? Close your scriptures with me as the band comes back.